Hello, listeners. A brief reminder about the Morinoko's holiday giveaway. Check out episode 32 featuring Colin Jones of Weltworks for a complete listing of the prizes totaling over $250 worth. The giveaway is happening over the month of November. To enter, it's really simple. Shout out the more you know co and spread the word on social media. And make sure you tag us, either on Facebook or Instagram. Once you've tagged us in a post and you've let your wonderful friends know all about us, we will private message you and confirm that you've been entered into the giveaway. We don't want you wondering all through the month of November if you truly, truly, truly got entered into the drawing. So we're going to put your mind at ease. If you win, we'll reach out to you via that private message on Facebook or Instagram. And to be entered into the drawing, all you got to do is tag us in that post by the end of Saturday, November 17th. This time, I am sitting down with Nick Kinney, the executive director of the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra. Similar to my episode with Colin Jones, I hardly got a word in because Kinney knows his stuff. I was thrilled to hear Kinney's take on several things during the episode, and stay tuned to find out what top secret organization our guest today happens to be a part of. I bring you the episode and Nick Kinney. All right, hello listeners out there. Once again, the more you know, Co. coming at you live in person. I sit here with Nick Kinney, the executive director of the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra. Good morning. Good morning. Sitting here on a crisp Friday morning in downtown Greeley at the offices of the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra. To my understanding, it is the 108th season of the Greeley Philharmonic. That's correct. We started in 1911, formed as a very small organization, mostly teachers and students from members of the community, and now we've morphed into one of the premier regional professional orchestras in northern Colorado and, well, all over Colorado. Yeah. 108th season was so surprising to me because I wondered, was Greeley even a a town? It was. It was founded in 1869. Um, Horace Greeley actually came out here and loved the land. Denver was colonized. Cheyenne was colonized. But there was a vast scape of land in between the two. So he wrote an article to um, the New York Times, or whatever the paper was at the time in New York, calling people to move out west. He was hoping for, I don't know, a couple hundred people, got thousands of responses. But the two kinds of people he wanted here were those with money and those who were cultured. So within a year of Greeley being formed, there was a brass band. A few years after that, an opera house was built just right downtown on 8th Avenue. And not long after that, the orchestra formed. Is the old opera house where the crest is? No, I think that building's gone. Oh, okay. I've got a history book for you I'll give you on the way out. Um, I've been meaning to roll over to the Greeley History Museum. I've heard nothing but good things. It is good. It's right down the street there. Yeah. Um, we've got, if you walked in our office, a huge, I don't know, 15-foot poster board that shows the history of the orchestra, where we started, where we were playing, when it became a professional orchestra rather than a community orchestra, when we moved venues, when the Civic Center was built up until almost present day. Yeah, so let's jump back there. It was a it was a community orchestra, and when did this become a legitimate organization? Well, I'd like to think it was legitimate from the get-go. <laughs> okay. Um, but at that time, it was more playing for fun and playing for something to do on the weekends uh-huh. and in the evenings because you'd go out and work all day, you'd farm all day, whatever the jobs were back then. I'd like to think that, you know, back then we were battling typhoid fever and, and other things, and orchestras were the way to escape reality, the long days on the farms or raising cattle, and what Greeley is really known for agriculturally, but also very driven culturally, musically in this town. And in the 30s, I'd have to go look at my poster board and sheet a little bit. Um, The orchestra members started to get paid. No, they started paying for admittance to concerts. And then eventually the orchestra members would get paid, I think, a whopping five cents or ten cents per service. Ooh. Um, We a lot of money back then. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then really when Howard Skinner took over, really propelled the orchestra forward. At that time, there were a lot of teachers at UNC, and their students would be their stand partners, essentially. And as we continued to grow, and Howard brought in really a high caliber of musicians, is when it started transforming to be a very highly sought-out orchestra for musicians to want to perform with. 
And by the time he retired in the year, you know, early 2000s, mid 2000s, you know, we were we were a driving wrecking force in, in the community. You were going to a concert on a Saturday night. Mm-hmm. Glenn Cortese has since come in and just launched us even further. So what used to be a very community-centered organization of the musicians were in town, part of the community. We have musicians all the way south as Colorado Springs up through Cheyenne and Casper, Wyoming, with a few of them coming in from out of state um, beyond Colorado and Wyoming to be a part of this orchestra. Some of these seats that you get, you earn, you audition for, they're yours until, well, something may come up, another job, or you move out of town. Um, But our contrabassoonist was living in San Francisco for a long time and kept coming back to Colorado just for concerts. How often would they travel back? About six or seven times a year. It depends when he's called for. Not every piece calls for a for a concert bassoon. I think he's actually back in Colorado now playing at next Friday's concert. But all of our musicians are professional musicians. They are either professors, university teachers, or professional musicians to where they play in every orchestra that they can to make up their income. You know, they're at one, one weekend they're in Greeley, the next weekend they're in Fort Collins, Cheyenne, Casper, Colorado Springs, Denver, Longmont. They're, they're piecing together the musician life as it were and many of them do it quite successfully Mm. it immediately reminds me of the adjunct instructor life where you end up having to teach at multiple colleges to make ends meet because maybe not every university can give you the amount of coursework that it would take to sustain yourself and it sounds like that might be a similar situation for a lot of musicians out there it is and, and they find they know what their passion is Their passion instills the appreciation and love of music in a live performance setting. Boy, they put a lot of miles on their car doing it that way. But it's amazing how they're able to do that and have pieced together a career. So many students go to music school thinking they're going to be the next, um, you know, Dudamel or or Yo-Yo Ma. And it's, it's cutthroat. To get a position in a symphony is highly sought after. Auditions for even a trumpet position will bring out 20, 30, 40 people. If it's a higher-end orchestra like the Colorado Symphony, you could have hundreds of applicants gunning for one position. One. One position, yes. It's like the starting quarterback spot. You're you're looking all over the country or the world at who might be the next concertmaster or principal trumpet player for maybe the Colorado Symphony. The same is true for us of... We have an opening, and auditions are, are packed. Full days worth of auditions for a violin spot or, or a trombone spot, whatever vacancy we may have. And once you get a hold of that, you don't let that go. They, um, Like I said, unless they're moving out of, out of state or the distance is too far to travel, those are their seats until, until they're forfeit. And what's that process look like? How do you all put it out there? How do people find that this chair is open now? It's a really close community, whether you know it's Fort Collins or Cheyenne. A lot of our musicians work with each other in so many different settings. And the executive directors, we meet eh, once or twice a year just to brainstorm, toss some ideas around, but also informing each other when we do have those openings. Because the stronger an orchestra, I guess the more they play with one another and get familiar with their styles... Just the more cohesive unit they become, which means the performance is better. And the audience may or may not recognize that, but you, I think if we had two orchestras perform side by side, one of a bunch of musicians who had never played with each other, and one with a core group of musicians who've been together for months, years, decades even, there's a giant sound difference in that. Now, they're both professionals, but the more you work with somebody, just the more you familiarize yourselves, get to know the subtle nuances of their playing, and the same goes with the conductor. They get to experience and feel that and use that to the orchestra's benefit and, and power. Every orchestra, it's like a snowflake, essentially. They're all different, have their own unique characteristics, unique audiences, unique towns that they perform in. But the makeup is what creates those differences, and, and they're special. They're a special connection. So when we have auditions, we publish it on our websites and we distribute it to the other orchestra's executive directors and the musicians talk and share things all the time. You know, if they met somebody at a gig at a pub, I call it a pub, at a bar or a brewery and make a connection, they'll keep that in their mind of, oh, we have violin openings. This person played the violin at this event or or at a dinner, a catered dinner or whatnot, and they like their playing, they might want to encourage them to audition 
potentially take on that next role. For people out there who might be scratching their head thinking, all right, I understand the concept that people work better together when they've known each other for a period of time, but even myself, I sit here and wonder, how does that translate into how I play my instrument in a group of 40, 50 people? And so it's just a fascinating idea that we might play together better just by knowing each other's style and, and having heard each other play. I play ice hockey recreationally, <clears throat> and I... If you watch hockey on on TV or go to a live game or whether you go to a symphony, the camaraderie is very similar. Everyone's been trained tens of thousands of hours of practice and rehearsal just to get to that level, that caliber of a professional musician to be confident enough to audition for an orchestra, whether it's our orchestra or Fort Collins or the Colorado Symphony or, or bigger, Cleveland, New York, Philadelphia. The training is the same. Just like a left wing or a right wing, their, their jobs are there. Everyone knows their jobs from years and years of experience. Mm -hmm. But once you get the right players in place, a conductor, a concertmaster, a section player, it's like everything's firing on all cylinders. It's like when you find that perfect line that's your goal-scoring line in hockey where everyone on the ice knows, uh, you know, I'm a huge Blackhawks fan, knows Patrick Kane's style. They kind of can read and sense what he's going to do next to hopefully score a goal or to pass it to, to get an assist for a goal. And the same's with the orchestra. Um, intonation, tone quality, tone production, articulations, all these different styles of music. When you go out there to play a Beethoven symphony, you're going to be playing a Beethoven symphony differently than you're going to be playing John Williams' Star Wars suite. But the fundamentals are all the same. But everyone brings with them the icing on the cake or something. Their unique of, characteristics... Yeah. If you've ever been a part of a team or even relationships, you kind of sense, you're in that other sense, the sixth sense, seventh sense, however many senses we I feel. There's more than five out there. <laughs> and it's trust. It's relationship building. If your stand partner is not there for a concert, you kind of feel that void. Or the principal trumpet player is absent, so they bring in somebody else. Well, the style is just a little different, but do I like it or do I not like it? You know, And it could shift around depending on the piece. And those are the characteristics that really define our orchestra. For the Broncos, for instance, you're, we just lost to Marius Thomas this week. What kind of void will that have in the wide receiving core? You know, <laughs> what impact did he have, and will the next person be able to fill his shoes? Um, or how is that chemistry going to shift? Yeah, we're just like, you know, the stars you see on TV every weekend. We're the stars sitting up the four feet off the, you know, on the stage and presenting the highest quality live symphonic music we can muster. Speaking of John Williams' Star Wars Symphony, I want to point out and commend you. I enjoy that you have your very beautifully framed degrees here on the wall in your office. Why, thank you. And next to it, in an equally beautiful frame, you have the Star Wars Force Awakens. Um, poster here. The Force Awakens was definitely not my favorite of the Star Wars movies, but I grew up madly in love and passionate about Star Wars, mm. and in a previous career I was a artist for a practical effects studio, and our primary product was Star Wars costumes and props. Oh, so I no have way. a screen used built by myself Stormtrooper costume, and I I'm part of the 501st Legion, which is a worldwide costuming club and organization that donates its time and monies raised for charities across the world. Um, no our way. slogan is, bad guys doing good. So, uh, <laughs> You're part of the 501st. I am. Can you explain? I know exactly what that is, but can you explain what it is for people? Just yeah, it's, um, it's, God, it was founded, I think, in the early 90s and is essentially a costuming club for passionate Star Wars lovers to express their adoration for the movie and yeah. stories that have been told. So everyone, the requirements are you, you build a costume. You have to build it. You can't buy it because everyone's body shapes are different. You want to customize it yourself. Plus there's something about having it done yourself that makes just a little extra magical. And like I said, we get together. It takes about, I don't know, for me it took four or five months to build the costume get everything done. The helmet was the most challenging part of it, after which I built that costume. I started working for that company, the practical effects company. Oh, it just opened up my eyes. All people from every background and career you could imagine get together for a weekend or a day and raise money for Toys for Tots, or collect toys for Toys for Tots, raise money for the children's hospital. Yeah. And some of the most rewarding, we call them troops or events, have been at Children's Hospital, putting on a costume and creating magic for, 
for kids, for families, for adults even who love Star Wars and seeing Chewbacca walk down the street is just as exciting as, you know, seeing Peyton Manning in a grocery store, I think. (laughs) But I've been a part of that group for five years now and I don't troop as often as I had before because I'm a little tied up with work and some other hobbies too, but it's definitely a soft spot in my heart to put on the Stormtrooper costume and hopefully put a smile on someone's face or at times scare them where they think I'm a statue or a, I don't know, it's always fun to give people a little a scare too. Yes. Be a Stormtrooper. Right. That is so neat. That's very cool. I'm glad we got such on that. So the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra performs all or most or most or all of their shows at the Union Colony Civic Center. Yeah, most of our shows are at the Civic Center. It was built 30 years ago, and there's some discussion about why the Civic Center was built. Some feel that it was strictly for the orchestra, when really it was for the tax-paying citizens to have a great performance venue to bring in some wonderful productions. But at the time, that was really monumental for the Philharmonic to have such a beautiful hall be built. And the GPO was a huge factor in why it was built. A lot of our board members, staff members, and music director at the time were huge proponents of that being built in downtown Greeley. So for 30 years, that's been our home. We do venture out. We do a couple of outreach performances. One's Christmas Brass, and that takes place at the First United Methodist Church in downtown Greeley. We do run out concerts every now and again, but mostly the Civic Center has been our home and tremendous venue in northern Colorado. I think it's the I think it's the premier venue. You can ask everyone at the Civic Center too, they'll say the same thing, but great seats. There's not a bad seat in the auditorium at all. My my preference is the first balcony. You can see everyone on stage. You may not be as up close and personal as you may want to be. But seeing the whole production unfolding before your eyes is really magical and I think could add a sense of wow factor of, holy moly, you're getting 65 or 70 people to play at the exact same time, to breathe at the exact same time, to pluck a string at the exact same time. I don't know if you've ever had a classroom with students, or you can do this with adults too, of just asking them to clap once together. Count down, three, two, one, clap. And it sounds like a ripple. It sounds like thunder, depending how many people you have. And then you apply that to an orchestra. You're not counting down three, two, one, but you're prepping them to play. And everyone could play with the most beautiful sound at the exact same moment, at the exact same time. It's an art. It's a science. It's mathematical. It encompasses everything we learn in school, but applies it to music, sound, a performance, a memory, a experience. Yeah, there's more than just the pieces there. When they come together and they create this song together, live in front of you, there's some sort of magic exterior on top that you get this you get this aura and you experience. And it's one thing to listen to music, but I've always been a fan of live music. And to see an orchestra and to see, like you said, 40 to 60 people simultaneously play a piece. And you realize, like, wow, if, if any of these played by themselves, it would not be the same. Or if I took one of them out, it would not be the same. Absolutely. One thing I like to encourage folks to do is close their eyes during a performance. Sure, it looks like you're taking a nap or you're bored, and that's not. And I'm I'm guilty. I close my eyes because I don't want to be unencumbered by visual distractions of something moving in the background or a, or a percussionist moving from one instrument to the next during a piece. But I want to be so in tune with what the orchestra is performing that I don't want my vision to impair what I'm hearing. About there's a small percentage of people who get well, I'll just call them tingly sensations. <laughs> down their neck, arms, or spine when they hear live music. I'm one of those people. I could be there and I have the chills and it's just tingly. It's a very, I don't want to call it eerie, but a unique sensation that's magical just like the music. Not everyone experiences this, but I've tried to have that same experience in a quiet room, in a sensory deprived room, listening to music. It just doesn't do it for me. Spotify, iTunes, yeah, beautiful music, the score recordings from Star Wars that I listen to or Lord of the Rings. Yeah, live. Live is live is where it is and as music becomes more readily available at well what used to be a click of a button, now it's just a speak of a voice or a command. People aren't getting that magic. Plus, with live music, you always have the excitement of, holy moly, that string player's string just broke and snapped and made a loud (laughs) bang or crash or or a cymbal just fell off its stand. So you have that excitement of, hey, something could go wrong. I don't know what it could be, but 
you know, a string could break, a bow could break, uh, the conductor's baton could break. What's going to happen? You know, mm. it's kind of an audible, and you'd be amazed at how well they adapt. Just like a fumble in football or something, the quarterback snaps and fumbles. Everyone, ah, what do you do? What do you do? Well, sometimes it works out for the best. Sometimes it works out uh, poorly. I used to do a lot of pit productions, playing trumpet in pit orchestra, and that was the same thing with live theater. One day, a door of a set piece just fell in the middle of a scene. All right, well, there's a wow factor and an unexpected <laughs> factor. Or the curtain broke after um, intermission, so we had to pause the show for 45 minutes and. That was a late night for everyone there, but, um, you know, with those live performances, you always have that unknown factor of what might happen. 99% of the time, nothing happens. It's a great concert, and even when things do go wrong, no one picks up on it. A lot of people don't know. They don't know. Like, if if one part was played incorrectly by a group or even an individual, that person may be beating themselves up, but then the majority of the crowd has no idea. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as a musician who's had multiple mistakes in live performances... I turn beat red. I think, oh my gosh, did they hear me? Are they gonna are they gonna come flog me after the concert? And like I said, so many people just as an overall performance love what they heard and couldn't couldn't pick out one wrong note or a hundred wrong notes, but they were just so pleased with the performance or so happy with what they heard. Because they haven't spent the tens of thousands of hours rehearsing and practicing and getting those fundamentals, they've spent that time enjoying. Mm. I guess going back to the Star Wars thing with my costume, when you dive into that and maybe realize how many mistakes are made in a concert, we hope there are none. That's our goal, no mistakes. But something always happens. You turn two pages instead of one. You miscue the timpani or something like that happens. Or giving a speech, I fumble somebody's name or forget to mention something or another. Oops. But when you start getting into the nitty-gritty in the background of it, like with me and Star Wars, I used to think that stormtroopers were these heavily armored, really bombastic, iconic figures of Star Wars, whether they were terrible shots or not. They were still pretty <laughs> monumental to the recognition of Star Wars. You know, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader too. But then after working in the practical effects studio, it's just plastic. And then watching the movies now, I'm seeing the breaks in the plastic. I'm seeing the armor spread when somebody's walking when it shouldn't be spreading, but they adapted it to be more comfortable. I kind of ruined the magic of Star Wars for me and the Stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. I go, well, they aren't really heavily armored as the story goes. It's just plastic, glued together, painted, but I still love it. I, I, I got to get over that part, but you know, right. every time I put it on, I go, yeah, it's just a little less magical. And then once it's on and I look at myself, I go, all right. Yeah, this is pretty cool. This I'm is a, I'm legit. A stormtrooper. Yeah, it's a balance beam because you know you have the de- the devils in the details. You got to have the details right in order to get the big picture. But the big picture is where it matters, and I can easily see how that that funnels right here into an orchestra performance. Right. Uh, uh, s- Self disclosing a lot here. I am a fan of WWE wrestling. All right. And a lot of times when you tune in on television, it's live, but you know that if something drastic happens, they're either going to show it or they're going to shield the viewers on TV from seeing something that would be atrocious. When you're live, there's a realization you get during the match that if something goes wrong and if something bad happens to one of these performers... I'm going to see it. There's no editing. They're not going to be able to pause time or, or cut away to a commercial because I'm here. And I think what you were saying about being live in front of this orchestra performance, it's the same thing. You are right there and you realize, obviously you know it's not a recording from, from the time you walk in, but I think there's a, re- a feeling that sits in. I'm seeing this being made right now and it's in a way that I will never experience again. And no one else in this world is experiencing it who's not in this room right now. Absolutely. I think, I don't know if enough people realize that. You can hear a Star Wars suite a hundred times in your life, whether it's in a soundtrack or a recording or in the movie. But what you hear live or see live, whether it's a sporting event or a concert, that's only going to happen once. Of course, if you record it and take it home and you'll have that forever and cherish that memory. But, But that's different. Right. You don't have that connection that live interaction with our upcoming concert of beethoven's fifth you're only going to hear that from the orchestra this one time once we may do it again in 10 years 15 years but we're only doing this concert now mandy harvey was just here a few weeks ago you only experience that 
once her story her her songs her passion that she has for music you can catch up and read the article afterwards or go to the concert and buy a recording we don't have any recordings but if we did have recordings and we're selling them it's just it's not the same you were there you were sitting next to somebody you may have never met before or ever known in passing but you were sharing a moment and a memory together hopefully it was a great memory <laughs> and it, you just I don't know, that doesn't happen enough. With a, such a high-paced, busy society, one thing I commend music on, especially classical music or symphonic music live, is it allows you to take a step back, to take pause, to stop thinking about all of the deadlines you have coming up or what you're going to prepare for the grandkids' visit this weekend or where you're going to go on vacation how you're going to find, you know, everything that goes to our brains on a regular basis. When you're in a concert hall, that's what your focus is, is music. And all of those stressors kind of go away. I try to listen. I know the, the stigma is classical music is great studying music. It's soft and slow and boring, so it won't distract me from my studies. Well, no, on all of those. You're just not listening to the right music if you think it's boring. Holy moly, some of the most intense, bombastic pieces have been with classical music and orchestras. But it's background music. Whether you're listening to... I'm, I'm a guilty pleasure. I love the 80s music. That's you know my jam. My go-to soundtrack now is the Guardians of the Galaxy Volumes 1 and 2. And that's what I do for chores, for cleaning, for <laughs> whatever to get me motivated and pumped up. But at the end of the day, that's in the back of my mind. I'm not paying attention to the music. I might be singing along or dancing along to it, but it's not necessarily got my full attention. Even if I'm listening to something to relax me, well, if it's on my computer or on my TV, is it really relaxing or is it just background noise? When you're in a concert hall, I think that gets to be the forefront of your mind or your attention to where that is what's captivating you. You are seeing and hearing music performed right in front of you. No delays no recordings to make it the best sound it could possibly be. We all know Hollywood and how layers and layers and layers of recordings end up making the final product, but you're hearing it live. And when it sounds just as good live as it does on a soundtrack, then that's magic. That's when you know what you've heard is the quality that's being recorded in studios in New York or Los Angeles. I went down to the Colorado Symphony last spring, and they were doing Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. And I love John Williams. I love movies. I love how much music adds to a movie. And I have expectations. I know how hard it is to play a three-minute John Williams piece on trumpet, let alone an entire hour and 45 minutes of music live. And I was just blown away that it sounded exactly how I remembered it my whole entire life. And it was happening right in front of me with professional musicians in Colorado. And well, I got goosebumps just talking about that now. You just can't recreate that experience. I'd like to see more of that here in Greeley, some movie adaptations, so people can see and experience professional musicians that aren't in Hollywood, that aren't on the recordings that you may have listened to on the way to the concert, but that are performing it right in front of you for it to sound exactly how it does in the soundtrack without that heavy-duty equipment or everyone mic'd perfectly with sound technicians everywhere trying to get the balance, they're doing it by themselves. Essentially, they're doing it, I hate to say acapella, but with their instruments or with their voices. There's nothing enhancing or augmenting the sound that's coming from the stage. Yeah, so for our listeners, just to make it clear, or maybe it's even from my own question, so there's a movie playing, and they play the entire soundtrack. During the movie? They do. Right, yeah. So there's a, what they call a click track, and the conductor wears earphones, and it you know times everything perfectly for he or she to bring in the orchestra and play the music that should be playing in the movie. So they eliminate the soundtrack from the movie. You still have the voices and, yeah. the, and the sound effects and such, but as far as the core sounds, the core music goes, it's happening right on stage. Dang. Sometimes you have to bring in choirs. For example, Home Alone would need a choir, so you'd have the singing of a choir be where it should be in the in the scores. One of my favorite things to show people is, well, two things. One, there's a great clip from Star Wars, A New Hope. Everyone knows that by now I love Star Wars. <laughs> um, but it's the throne room scene at the end 
where they're recognizing Luke, Leia, Han, and Chewie and the droids for, you know, destroying the Death Star. And they're walking down, and it's got no music. Because the music's not happening while they're filming movies. And what you hear in the background, this is on YouTube. i got to try to find it and put it on the GPO website. Oh, yeah. This, um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. This is hilarious. You hear people coughing in the background, talking, shouting orders. And then they walk all the way up there. You hear feet shuffling and, and, and boots hitting the ground, resonating loudly. Stuff you don't hear in the movie. And then Chewbacca turns around and just yells. It's not even a Chewbacca roar. It's just, Rrr! it doesn't sound like him at all. And then you play that exact same scene again with the soundtrack playing and what was actually shown in the movie. And holy moly, the energy, the the joy, the enthusiasm is palpitating as is, is, is I don't know, you can't you can't change that. So yeah. music you can't recreate that any other way. And the music brings so much to T V shows, to movies, that I would love for there to be a day where music just didn't exist. One day. So you're at home watching your favorite TV show, your favorite movie, or in your car on the radio, or at a coffee shop, or in a bookstore, anywhere. There's no music. And I think people would go crazy because it's everywhere. You think we take music for granted? I think we take especially live music for granted. Because what's making these soundtracks and these recordings and, um, you know, whether you're a classical music fan through and through or a taylor swift fan or or i forgive me i don't know any rappers they get their starts from their live performances without the foundations and we're going back to the fifth grade even where people are starting to play instruments for the first time that's what the end game is of what you're hearing in star wars or star trek or um, harry potter that's what you're hearing in video game music. That's what you're hearing when you're rocking out to Journey or singing along with Journey at a karaoke night is this start, this foundation. And it starts in schools and it's, it progresses to high school, to honor bands, to honor orchestras, to regional professional orchestras, to um, premier orchestras of, of your state, like Colorado Symphony, like San Francisco, to the New York Phil to what's happening in Hollywood and all across the world. Lady Gaga has a, I think, a clarinet degree from Juilliard? I'd have to double-check my facts. But she's classically trained. Mm. And look at her now. She's a great pop star. And I, I, I know I take advantage of, of live music. I'm giving, you know, given opportunities to go check out a performance, and I look at my calendar and say, well, I don't really know if I can squeeze this in. I haven't been home all week. I think I might just sit this one out. Well, Nick, that's a live performance you just missed. That is your support of a live experience, whether it's opera, musical theater, orchestra, symphony, whatever. I'm missing out. High school bands. Come on, I gotta. Yeah, I. You've got to support all of that before the soundtrack to The Office, the main theme, isn't playing when your favorite show is on TV, or it's just not the same because we don't have that core, that support, and it starts just on a local level. And I'm, you know, I've got an education degree. It starts with our kids and our schools, and instilling that passion for music that will drive them to be either supporters of the arts or the artists themselves as time goes on. Um, there's so many talented children out there that may not have access to instruments or to go to a live concert and have their lives changed. When Mandy was here, she met a few kids from our school district, and I would like to think that them interacting with her have changed their lives in some way or another, hopefully positively, to being a leader in the deaf community, to letting those with disabilities know that Your successes have no bounds. There are very few restrictions that would keep you from doing what you've always wanted to do. Mandy lost her hearing going to music school and had to relearn how to sing, thought her music career was over, and now look at what it's blossomed to. Beethoven lost his hearing. The Fifth Symphony that we're doing next week, this is probably a moot point, but that we're doing on November 9th. um, We'll try. Yeah, we'll see how it happens. That was the symphony... He wrote at the height of his time going deaf. And it's very ominous. The the four notes that everyone knows, dun 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 that interval is deafness knocking at his door. His career ending knocking at his door, coming for him. Back then we you know, 
1700s, and I don't... We've come a long way medically. What he achieved after going deaf, writing more symphonies, the seventh was very <laughs> somber, very solemn, sad. It's my favorite Beethoven symphony. You know, when things just weren't going right for Beethoven. And then you have his ninth symphony, which is a joyful ode to joy. That's when he's finally like, all right, I'm deaf, but this doesn't hold me back. I'm going to I'm gonna keep writing beautiful music and beautiful symphonies. I had an ocular migraine the other day. I couldn't see for about 45 minutes. It's like, oh my gosh, my world is crumbling. What am I going to do without my eyes for 45 minutes? And here Beethoven has a full career you know, after going deaf. <laughs> Mandy Harvey has a full career after going deaf and defeating all odds. There are so many success stories from folks who are so passionate and driven. And a lot of that, I think, comes from, from the arts. From I, I love the Olympics. I'm a sucker for the Olympics. And I liked to watch that um, for the Winter Olympics last year. Getting to know the athletes, the representatives of our country at the Olympics. And when it was a segment on Netflix I was watching... The skiers, the snowboarders, the the curling folks. I love curling. It's a fun sport. Uh, but when asked to showcase their secret talent, a lot of them were musicians. Singing with a guitar. Um, one was an opera singer. Actually, it's an ex-NFL player who's an opera singer now. And, well, I was cheering for them even more knowing that they had a musical background. They weren't, uh, you know, some of them had other passions too, but most of it was some sort of music. And I just, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Me, as a musician, my hobby is playing sports, like hockey. I'm never going to be a professional athlete. I have dreams of being a goalie, you know, for a warm-up session for, you know, the Eagles or something someday, but I'm not staying up at night practicing on that. I just like to recreationally enjoy playing hockey and being competitive. And it's nice to see athletes being recognized and not afraid to showcase their musical talents and abilities or whatever other passions that they may have that may have been viewed differently even 5, 10, 15 years ago. I think tying in the 501st and the costuming clubs that have blown up over the past decade, people are so much more comfortable with who they are and not afraid to show it. And I think that we've just come such a far way as, as, as people and humans to honor that. The geek culture is at the height of culture now. I mean, Comic-Cons are huge. People cosplaying is getting out of their comfort zones, finding friendships and relationships by embracing their passions and not being afraid of what others might see that as. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who may not have been comfortable singing in front of somebody because of whatever stigmas that were there in school or after school or who knows, I'm just using my own life as an example, um, being a band nerd and a choir geek. So what? Look at me now. Look at where music and the arts have taken me, have taken my musicians, taken celebrities, taken athletes. Like That's just such a strong foundation and core and, and big part of who they are that they're no longer afraid to admit it or to flaunt it or showcase what their passions are. And I hate to say it, but you know, you see a professional hockey player playing on an Olympic team and you think, well, I wonder, I bet for fun they work out, you know, or they're just, it's fitness, fitness, fitness. And to see, holy moly, you play a ukulele or you play the bagpipes. Are you kidding me? You play the bagpipes and you're a forward for a hockey for Team USA. Wow. Or you, you sing, you perform. I think that's, awesome that these once very different paths whether you have to be a football player or you have to choose marching band or choir you can't do both those barriers are being broken you can do both you can do whatever the heck you want to do do what makes you the best person that you can be that will make you the most happy that will hopefully in turn bring happiness and joy to others whether you're the concert master for the greedy philharmonic or you're the starting quarterback for the denver broncos Whatever your passion are, whatever you do, likely will be bringing happiness and joy to somebody else. Whether it's, well, that was a good concert, or holy moly, that touchdown pass was awesome, we just won another Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, somebody hopefully is jumping for joy um, and taking something away from, from what they've done. Are there any musicians currently with the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra that you think maybe 10, 20 years ago would not be... A part of your team because as now they feel emboldened to, to get out there and take that risk and be part of your organization? Well, I don't want to call anyone out, but there have been some great stories that my musicians have told. 
we're let, we're asking them to introduce themselves before concerts to make it more personable for our concert goers, for our patrons, to get to know who's up there performing. It's like when you're announcing the starting lineup for the Broncos, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so, I went mm-hmm. to so-and-so university. Well, we're going a little more in-depth than that. So two stories stick out. One was from our second trombonist, uh, Dr. Frank Cook, finished his doctorate at UNC not too long ago. And he was telling a story about when he wanted to take up an instrument. Well, what instrument? He found out that trombone was the loudest instrument. So that's what he chose. <laughs> All right, now look at him. He's, uh, he's got his doctor in, doctorate in music. He's, he's teaching at two universities. And he's a professional trombone player. I don't know where he would be had he not found the trombone. Another one was our principal cellist. And she was telling a story at last year's Children's and Family Concert about how, had it not been for her school going to a professional orchestra concert, I think this was in the Pacific Northwest, for fifth grade, she never would have even considered picking up an instrument or the cello. And now she is principal cellist for three orchestras within 40 miles of us. So I don't know what her path would have been had she not been exposed to music at at this age at this time or you know whenever it was she was a fifth grader Mm. so we do fifth grade concerts and hope that whether we touch one life or a thousand lives at that concert that we've made an impact on on them so that way they can explore every option that's out there i think in our changing society too you know you really can be whatever you want to be it's just how much work are you going to put into it do you want to be an astronaut Do you want to be a concert master for the New York Philharmonic? And how hard are you going to work for that? And that's the people who are up there performing today, next week, any concert. They've worked for those spots. They have practiced. They've given themselves calluses. They've bled. They've, you know, poured their heart and soul and tears into into their careers. And you can sense that when you go to concerts, just as you can sense, you know, the passion of a world-famous chef if they're cooking in front of you or explaining their process or it's anyone who's passionate about anything they're they're so much fun to talk to and to hear their stories whether it's a brewer or a distiller or a violinist their passions i hope are contagious and seeing those folks up there pouring out their souls and their stories i hope are resonating with folks who are still wanting to do that not just children who were trying to get into music and keep in music, but for the 50-year-old concert goer who played piano as a second grader, and then after hearing a piano concerto thinks, you know what, I'm going to take lessons. I don't care if I'm 50 years old. I want to learn how to play the piano and do what I tried to do 40 or 45 years ago. And who knows? Maybe they're doing a recital at a church or for their friends. Um... Or just show off with their friends at a holiday party. You know, that's always fun to do. I can just do choir warm-ups and a piano. So everyone always asks me to play piano. I said, well, everyone get ready to sing because that's all I know. But yeah, we're, we're changing lives and not just children, not just teenagers, giving them unique education and performing experiences, but anyone who's wanting to try something new, no matter the age. I play hockey with a 71-year-old retired district attorney. 71 years old. He's still playing hockey. Holy moly, Mike. That's awesome. Heck yeah. I hope to make it to 50 years old, let alone playing <laughs> hockey when I'm 50 or 60 or 70. But, you know, that passion, if you, if you, well, that's me. If I find a passion, I'm putting myself into it 100%. If I find an interest, all right, I'm applying myself. If I don't like it, well, I've got other things that I'd like to try. And I hope that music is something that everyone will explore or consider exploring or just supporting and and being a part of the community that makes the orchestra the community's orchestra. Yeah. You've mentioned it a couple of times with Changing Society, um, social media, we got Netflix, binging, Hulu, all the reasons to stay home. And even if you do leave the house on the weekend, there are so many places to go in Colorado. We're talking mountains, going outside. We're talking pubs, as you say, breweries, bars, movies, other concerts with our with all these pieces of entertainment competing for our interests and our time 
Do you feel like the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra is doing well in the midst of all of these chaotic options? I think the GPO is headed in the right direction of becoming more relevant. We are torn in so many places. Schedules are busier than I ever could recall as a child in my parents' schedule at the time and wonder how people balance that. You did say there are so many options to, to enjoy. Why come to an orchestra concert? Why go to a choir concert? Why go to a community theater production? I wish I had the magic answer because that would help so much with orchestras. And orchestras have failed across the country for the past 10, 15 years. They're just shutting the doors. They don't have the revenue they once had because of these streaming services, because of how much there is to do in their community. So we've trimmed back our concert season to not overwhelm our patrons. We've adapted our programming to entice a broader audience to whereas you may not want to come to a Beethoven symphony, but you don't want to miss points at a pops because that is Christmas extravaganza, and that's one show you'll never miss. And if you have time for another concert and here or there, great. But trying to give that diverse spread of options so that way every concert that we perform is so unique that we hope that they'll feel like they can't miss that event. The older structure was you know, three, four, five, or six Masterworks concerts, which are all classically classical pieces of works, you know, concertos and symphonies. And to, you know, an average concert goer, they may all sound like the same concert, boom, 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 throughout the year. But with our twists that we're doing, with our more diverse pops programming, what you hear at our first concert isn't going to be what you hear at the finale concert. What you hear at this Masterworks concert is not going to be the same as what you hear at our February's Masterworks concert. And spreading uh, spreading our wings, spreading our... Hmm, I don't know a good word for it. Repertoire? Yes. The classical music repertoire is huge. So big. I mean, tens of thousands of pieces of music can be selected for a concert. It's hard to choose what to do, you know. How does it fit the theme? How does it fit the mood? You know, you don't want to play a Rachmaninoff piece next to a, you know, Duraflay record. Yeah, I don't know what you're doing. You you takes a lot of finagling um, to get that down. But how we maintain our relevancy and make us a destination by doing those unique programs to do something that you can't hear anywhere else. Sure, you'll have other competitions with the other orchestras around, but do you really want to drive to Colorado Springs to hear a classical piece when we may be doing it in Greeley a couple years later? We had Mandy Harvey. No one else had Mandy Harvey. We're doing Beauty and the Beast in the spring. Well, you don't have to go to Denver to get a Broadway musical. We'll have one right here in Greeley with our own orchestra, with the university, with the Civic Center. This is going to be a huge production, and you can you know save some money and some time and have a great night out in town. When I first moved to Colorado, I didn't think there was much to do in Greeley. I'd rather go to Fort Collins or Denver. I lived in Fort Collins for a year. Boy, it's just too busy. I, I, I don't like it. Moved to Loveland, eh, didn't have enough. Finally got back to Greeley, you know, 2015, and what a facelift Greeley's had. The downtown is just thriving and bustling. New businesses opening up. The breweries are just knocking it out of the park. It used to be you'd go anywhere but Greeley for the breweries, and now... Wiley Roots and Wellbrooks and Tower 56 Distillery. Holy moly. I don't leave Greeley much anymore because there's so <laughs> much to do in town. And why would I go spend my money in Fort Collins when I could have just as good of an experience here in Greeley? We've got, I'll stand by this, the best regional professional orchestra in the state or in the region. I'd include Wyoming and Nebraska and Kansas and We've got a quality orchestra here. You don't have to go far to find that quality music. Though the stigma may be that classical music is dying, I find that to not be true. One, thanks to children and video games, because that music is classical music. Same musicians, well, not same musicians, but same orchestration, same instruments, and it complements the video game. Kids love video game music. I want to do a video game concert pretty soon in the next year or two. Maybe team up with the Comic-Con in Greeley if we want to start one up. That might be a good fundraiser. But finding our relevancy and, and yeah, classical music isn't dying, isn't dead. Sure, orchestras are struggling, 
but have they adapted to what people want to hear? And I still don't know what people want to hear. I'm always asking people at the grocery store, at a coffee shop, hey, what do you like? What do you want to hear? What would get you in the concert hall? Play some Journey. All right, well, mm. let's see what we can do. Let's, you know, I file everything in the back of my head because our community is what's going to sustain us and keep us going. And if we're not adapting and presenting what they want to hear, then the next 108 years may be rocky for us. But it, I hope people are seeing our slogan, Old Orchestra with a New Attitude, for our Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, we're giving every audience member, the first 500, a kazoo to participate along with the orchestra Dun, 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 dun. They'll have some instruction and they will be, you know, we're not going to actually play during the concert. Um, but to show them to, to you know, play a little bit with the orchestra and hear how that theme and motive carries on throughout the piece. I don't know of any other orchestra that's given an audience a kazoo. This could backfire tremendously <laughs> and I may be out of a job in two weeks. Um, or it could be the start of something very unique and very interesting. I can't say we're going to do kazoos again. But a one-and-done time of, holy moly, that orchestra just gave their audience kazoos. That's a lot of trust to put in your audience members to not be kazooing around during a clarinet solo or a clarinet concerto. Um, but I think our audience can handle that. I think they're going to have a really good time. And and it'll be silly, it'll be fun, but also educational. To whereas what they're going to be introduced with while playing the kazoo, they might be listening for for the rest of the symphony. Sitting still for 42 minutes is a really hard feat for, I think, just about everybody these days, myself included. So to give them something to listen to, to focus on for a symphony, and then maybe making a competition with, with their date or their spouse. Hey, how many times did you hear that during the concert? Uh, six? Well, I heard it 12 times. Haha, I win. I don't know. You know, get some healthy competition going to increase the experience of, of our concert goers. Yeah. What will make us different? How will we make sure we're still relevant? By doing something that may not have been done before. Finding more ways to present classical music, live symphonic music, to the masses that could be appealing. And we're just now opening those doors and exploring those options. One of it's our programming. How do we program what the audience wants to hear? Believe it or not, a lot of people love Western music they like it in Greeley. We have a strong agricultural and uh, maybe not as much of a cowboy feel as we once had. But Western music is just fun. It's, I don't know, stirs the emotions of the Wild West and what it was may have been like 150, 200 years not ago. Not too long ago. Not too long. We're still, you know, really young out here. That's huge. You know, are we going to introduce a western themed series where we have all western music and folks come dressed up as cowboys and cowgirls there's a lot of cowboys and cowgirls in this area in the front range i think they'd love to come out to that to be more relaxed in the concert hall you don't have to wear a suit and tie and tuxedos to an event come comfortable come relaxed that's what you're doing here you are escaping reality in it whatever fashion they may that may be or you're going to hear a friend perform or your child sing with the orchestra or I don't know what your reason is. Maybe you just love our institution and want to keep coming back and supporting us so we continue on for another 108 years. But whether you're a first-time ticket buyer or a 30-year veteran, 40-year veteran, I, I want to make sure that they're having a great time. And that every time that they come back to a concert or have a decision to make, whether it's a GPO concert one night or competing with, I don't know, a performance at the Moxie or a big production down in Denver, I'm hoping that with what we're doing and introducing to our audiences that they're going to pick us. When it comes to even years ago when orchestras were forming, businesses would move their companies, their corporations, their headquarters to a town that had an orchestra because it showed that they were cultured and two, it gave their employees something to do on the weekends. You don't want to build a company, a large headquarters somewhere in, I don't want to pick on anyone in Colorado, so I'll say back in my hometown of Indiana, um, Fort Wayne had a huge, still does, mega corporations that are housed there and it's got everything you'd want for your employees. they very professional orchestra, minor league baseball, minor league hockey, tons of parks, you know, something that those 
employees won't have to drive to Indianapolis or to Chicago to experience. They can experience it there. And so that's why orchestras, a lot of them formed, because companies would feel that it's important to them and the community and their employees to have that kind of opportunity, that elegance to go to a concert. And we still have that. But look at our town. We have so many music venues. You can hear a violin duo at the brewery. You can hear... Um, you know, a little rock group at another brewery. All nights of the week they have these musical live performances somewhere. So you're torn on where to go. Yeah. So I'm hoping, you know, with what we're doing, all right, I hear they had a great concert. I hear somebody got to play a kazoo with the <laughs> orchestra. Wow. Um, what are they going to do next? That's what I want folks to, uh, to start experiencing this season is, all right, What's next for the GPO? What are they going to do to knock our socks off at the next concert or for next season? Um, the unknown, the interest factor, I guess. Perfect segue. My next question is, what are your next big events? You mentioned Beauty and the Beast in the spring, and you mentioned Beethoven's Fifth coming up, I think, a week from now or two. What's on the horizon, on that, the horizon. that our listeners can attend? We've got a great lineup. Like I said, this is our most diverse season that we've ever had as far as classical music programming and pops concerts. So we're tracking the season very closely with what sells and what doesn't sell. It's important for us to showcase the classical masterpieces because that's a rich part of our history that's shaped so many musical genres that it's kind of an honor to be able to hear those pieces performed live. For our season this year, we're in a weird shift, too. We're in the middle of a conductor search. Our music director of 12 years is um, heading to different journeys in his career, and we've been so lucky to have him. A normal lifespan for a music conductor of a regional orchestra of this size is about four to seven years, and we've had Glenn for 12, and he's really launched us into a, a great position moving forward. But we're excited to, you know, next year, the 2019-2020 season, have some finalists for the next music director position. So that'll generate some excitement for next year. But as far as the 1819 season, we've got Beethoven's Fifth Symphony coming up with audience participation. And that's also got Rossini's Barber of Seville Overture. So if you've become familiar with Bugs Bunny, you'll recognize that piece. <laughs> and we're featuring our principal clarinet player, um, Robert Vital, who's in the Air Force Band down in Colorado Springs, and he's going to be performing a clarinet concerto that 10 years ago this year, he won his first concerto competition with this piece. So it's an exciting, interesting, challenging clarinet concerto um, that we're honored to have Robert perform, and hopefully the audience will really um, sink their teeth into that. Our holiday season's very busy. We've got Poinsettia Pops, which has been around for, I think, coming up on 30 years, which is just Christmas in your face, holidays in your face. We've got the children's chorale that sings with the orchestra, the greedy chorale that sings. We bring in guest soloists. Or, um, Katie Runkle from UNC this year is our soloist. And it just gets you in the holiday spirit. And that also concludes the Festival of Trees in town, which is the largest Festival of Trees presentation in the country, right here in Greeley, Colorado. Hmm. So if that doesn't get you in the holiday spirit, we've got Christmas Brass, which is our brass section. As and as a brass player, I'd like to think this is one of the best concerts of the year that's held at First United Methodist Church. And you've got 14 brass players and a percussionist that just play all of your favorite hymns and carols in a small, intimate setting that's decorated like Christmas. And again, if you're not feeling in the Christmas mood by that point, well, then we haven't done our job. Um, we dive in. Our second Masterworks concert of the year is sort of musical speed dating with classical music. It's called Around the World in 80 Minutes, and we're featuring musical masterpieces from different cultures and countries from all across the world, all in one concert. So you can see how the sounds of a piece from China may either sound similarly to or completely different than a piece from South America or Central America, all with the same instruments. Nothing changes, just the styles are different and the interpretations are different. So I, And that's paired with our children's concert, too, to expose them to how these same instruments in, in an orchestra can do all of these different sounds from all of these different countries. You get very cultured in one night. You, know, you can have exposure <laughs> to all of these different cultures. Then in the springtime, we have Disney's Beauty and the Beast, the Broadway musical, we're showcasing 
the exceptional talent of the UNC School of Theater of Dance with David Grapes and his yeah his his department there full sets full costumes the orchestra is going to be in the pit playing the music from from Beauty and the Beast that'll Very be a two night nice. extravaganza and then our conclusion our finale concert as we bid farewell to Maestro Cortese is very traditional for us for 20-some years. We've had the choirs from UNC come and sing with the orchestra, a big, huge orchestra with a giant choir. Um, a few years ago, we did Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy. Um, last year, we did a Requiem, and this year, we're doing another Requiem, some of the most beautiful music you'd, you'd hear, you know, typically in churches and cathedrals in Europe, right here in Greeley. So we're honored to conclude our season in bombastic fashion as we normally do and who knows what 2019 2020 will look like we've got some very tasty plans for some (laughs) concert ideas next season that i'm excited to sign and lock in on and and again people will see this shift with the orchestra especially as we introduce guest conductors as we try to narrow down the search to our next music director of what they're going to bring to the orchestra what level of musicianship will they bring what level of excitement will they generate within the orchestra within the audience and within the community and are they going to be willing to push the classical music buttons that we're pushing this year with kazoos or you know i'm not sure what the future lies I encourage everyone to stay tuned as we're adapting to modern times. Like I said, we've been around 108 years. Orchestras, there's been hundreds who have closed in the past 10 years that have had to shut their doors. Thanks to our community, thanks to our patrons, our donors, our sponsors. We're still here and we're we're not going anywhere. Yeah, excellent. If people want to get tickets for a show, I assume the website or drop in if it's not sold out. At the UCCC? Yes, the box office at the Civic Center is open from 12 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, plus they're open late on the days of our events. Or visit GreeleyPhil.org. That's where we keep everything up to date with our concert season, our news, our blogs, our special events. We put on a Beer and Spirits Festival as a fundraiser every year. A lot of people don't associate an orchestra with Beer and Spirits Festivals, but holy moly, is that a fun event. And we love to partner with the breweries and distilleries in Colorado and beyond to... Um, introduce our musicians as the musical entertainment playing modern music on classical instruments so the game of thrones theme or star wars cantina band it's been a really big hit the past this is our fifth anniversary coming up on april 13th of 2019 again how orchestras are maintaining their relevance in their communities by being culturally exciting and up to speed on Mm. what's changing yeah, and that's being hold, uh, held at the Colorado Model Train Museum. Yes, just, uh, just a few blocks from here. Just a few blocks from here. We had a beautiful day last year, sunny and um, good time, good music. Somebody walked away with $700 from our 50-50 raffle. How often do you go to a beer festival and walk away with $700? Normally, I walk away with a light buzz and call an Uber. <laughs> um, but boy, that's got a, got a nice turnout to it. Yeah. Well, very good. Nick, if people want to reach out to you and ask you any specific questions about your role or the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra, what's the best way to get a hold of you? They can drop by my office anytime. I'm located at 801 8th Street, Suite 230 above Mariposa Flower Shop. Um, I love meeting people. I love talking to people. I like hearing their stories. They can call the office, 356-6406, or my email, nick, N-I-C-K, at greeleyphil.org. That's Greeley, P-H-I-L dot org. And I'm always up for a cup of coffee or a walk around downtown or just to chat with somebody. I love hearing ideas. I love hearing what I'm doing wrong and what they'd like to see done differently. There's a lot of strong opinions out there, but I do take everything um, and process it and, and help that apply to our board and what our plans are for the future. By gosh, if they want to hear something played, then I will take their considerations down and and try to plug it in at some point in our future but i like people i like talking i like sharing my story i like hearing their stories folks can reach out to me anytime day or night and i'm happy to happy to mingle or see me at you know out in the community i'd love to meet you shake your hand absolutely show show you where tower 56 is where (laughs) well works is wiley roots you know even folks who aren't in our community noco is a big place 
Yeah. Greeley's got a lot to offer. So I agree. If they need a tour downtown or of, of Greeley, I know a lot of great people who can help them out. Yeah. Good old reality. Reality is great. Well, Nick, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. I appreciate this. Thank you so much. As always, I want to shout out Russell Isaac Long for all the wonderful music used here at the Moyenoko. Are you looking for a little bit of bonus content in addition to the regular episodes on the show? Look for us out there on the interwebs on Facebook and Instagram, all at the Moyenoko. Until next time, peace!